But what are, the, are these Jesuits and Catholic divines doing promoting liberty? With all this ideology, they are provoking men to rebel against the powers that be, which is rebellion against God. Remember, when the people rebel, vengeance is taken sevenfold on them. And that's what's going to ultimately bring the world back into the bondage of the Dark Ages. And it's going to happen for a little bit. Revelation 17 says it. I've been noticing throughout history this idea of God-ordained authority upon earthly powers. And the role this has played in, in the Reformation is the part that I want to talk about today. The way that the Catholics and the Reformers understood the powers that be was vastly different. And who they looked to as the supreme earthly authority was totally different. I've called this Jesuitical liberation theology versus the Reformation. I wanted to show how persuasive and right they seem to be. As Proverbs 14 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, there's going to be some right things about a lot of the arguments that they portray, but when we, we have to always compare um, everything with Scripture, everything with what God says, no matter how right they seem. So, to recap, the mark of Cain we saw was a mark that God set upon, upon him after he had murdered his brother in that terrible day. And we saw in Genesis 4.15, the Lord said unto him, Cain, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. We showed that that mark was like a badge of authority that he was to wear. That, that no one would, would challenge his authority he had. Because God needed to set a ruler to rule over the wicked people because God foresaw that there was going to be people that were very unruly in, after in successing gener successive generations, and they needed uh, someone to control them. And that person had to have a heavy hand, and Cain was the um, first in, a, in, the, in this dynasty of rulers of evil that has continued throughout time, as we saw in these reliefs. The star over their heads, this eight-pointed star we see throughout in Babylon and in Assyria, and even in modern times, the, the uh, Supreme Court building with that eight-pointed star in the lattice work, we see it everywhere. Even in Rome, St. Peter's there, Masonic Temple, Harvard. And again, that one was from Hyde Park. I noticed that's where there's a statue dedicated to Aquarius. You can see it in the, in the path there. It's all over the place. Romans 13 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. So the main world powers, we saw Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And these powers, not being Christian, were no, nonetheless ordained of God to rule over evil. Now these world powers, by and large, religious toleration was, was, a, was a character of them. They, they let, people, let you believe what you liked, so long as you didn't challenge their secular authority. Um, Babylon had some, but we saw, we know Babylon was a bit persecuting sometimes under Nebuchadnezzar with the, the worthies in the fire. And pagan, pagan Rome also had some persecution. But by and large, generally, they allowed you to believe as you, you chose. And this was in harmony with the, the mark that was to take vengeance upon those who would challenge the authority rather than, rather than persecute God's people. That's not what's stipulated in that in that. Um, verse in Genesis regarding Cain. But there was one power that Daniel calls diverse from the others. The little horn, which is symbolized in the feet partly of clay and, and iron that uh, came out of Rome. This power John saw in vision in Revelation 17. He said, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great astonishment. It's supposed to be. He was astonished because it was, a, it was a professedly Christian power. He was used to seeing pagan Rome persecuting the saints, but now this was someone who professed to believe in Jesus persecuting the saints. Now, this power was different to the others uh, in, the, in that it, 
it's it was just relentless in persecuting God's people. It didn't didn't punish evil so, so much. It punished good. Daniel 8, we've read this before, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. This is talking about the papacy, Daniel 8. It was mighty not by its own power. She obtained the dominion not through military campaigns of her own armies anyway, but through craft and sophistry. She destroyed the mighty and holy people. That was, that was the, a specific characteristic of her. <clears throat> and this, this craft, this sophistry of Rome was her greatest weapon. It was f more effective than armies. Towards the end of this dominion, Martin Luther was debating, uh, debating with Dr. Eck. And it, the debate was over the primacy of the Pope, the Pope's right to be the head of the church. Daubigny, Merle Daubigny in his book, History of the Reformation, writes this in, in the context of that debate. He writes, Christianity has two great adversaries, hierarchism and rationalism. To bring into accord with reason or cause something to seem reasonable. To provide plausible but untrue reasons for conduct. This was the weapon of the papacy. And apply that to a religious sense to provide plausible but unbiblical reasons for doctrines. Now, rationalism can be defined as, in a religious sense, as exalting human reasoning over, over scripture, over divine truth. It, it was rationalism that destroyed the apostolic church. And as I said, this was the, this was the way they, they gained that ascendancy. That's what, this is how the Pope and, the, and the, the papal hierarchy became the head of the church, through, through rationalism. Rationalism underpins hierarchism. Apostle Paul spoke of the falling away. He said, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So it was through the philosophy and vain deceit, the rationalism that spoiled the church. And once their people were spoiled, they became the captives of the hierarchy. Now this rationalism, although it's, may seem plausible and may have some strong arguments its strongest point is that it appeals it has an appeal to the carnal nature it is somehow there's something appealing about it that 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 draws you as we read here for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lusts they shall heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears see their ears were itching for it they, they these are things that they wanted to hear they wanted to hear things that meant they didn't have to fight self and things that would that please the carnal nature and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned under fables and this is this is what eventually built made the man of sin appear that as paul said in second thessalonians chapter 2. see rationalism this rationalism that they taught released men from obedience to bible truth to ultimately to god for example born sinners teachings born sinners teaches that Sin is, you're not personally responsible for your own sins. It's something, you're born a sinner, therefore it releases you from personal accountability. And, and the way you overcome sin doesn't have anything to do with your will because it's, 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 you're, you're born a sinner and there's nothing you can do about it. It's somehow, they go through this Gethsemane experience and God does everything. You don't actually make a choice. So it appeals in, in so much as you don't have to do anything. You don't have to. You don't have to have any any struggle. You don't have to fight your your own self. And another way they thing they rationalized was the communion service that Christ instituted in the upper room. Christ taught his disciples to partake of the bread and the wine, which was a symbol that taught them that they had to partake of his life, that life of self sacrifice. And Rome changed that into you go to church once a week or once a day and eat a biscuit and then go home and and then you, and you're saved. Come back the next week, have another biscuit, you're going to heaven. You can see how they, how they use, they, they rationalize scripture. They change, they change the, the teachings of scripture to suit the carnal nature. Notice that it's the philosophy and vain deceit that underpin the hierarchy. That's the way it goes. You knock away the, you take away the philosophy and vain deceit, the hierarchy collapses. This works on an individual level and on a national level. And the, the entire of Christendom was brought into this 
bondage, except for obviously the, 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 the remnant that fled into the wilderness. Because in the Council of Nicaea, they instituted these teachings such as the Trinity, born sinners and all these other uh, philosophical teachings into the state religion. And anyone who did not believe these things was prescribed, such as Arius. I think that's supposed to be him on the bottom of the picture there. And as Second Peter says, Liberty to them promising, themselves being servants of the corruption, for by whom anyone hath been overcome, to this one also he hath been brought into servitude. So the priests and the popes, with their rationalism, overcome you with their, with their philosophy. And if you, when you, once you accept that, you become, you become a, a, in bondage to them. You become their servant. You become their slave. That's how these systems work. Because now your eyes are no longer looking to the Bible for your teachings, but you're looking to men. And when you're looking to them, they have complete control of you. That's how they controlled all of Europe. That's how they, that's how they gained their ascendancy. That's how they spoiled Christendom through philosophy and vain deceit. And a striking example of this is the story of a German King Henry and Hildebrand. King Henry IV of Germany had disregarded the Pope's authority. He was subsequently excommunicated and dethroned, according to the Pope. His, his lands were put under interdict, which means that no mass was being taken place, funerals and the mediation of the, of the priesthood was ceased. And as far as the people were concerned, because they were all under the spell of this sophistry, they were all, they were all going to hell if they died. And they, they couldn't relieve their relatives from purgatory and all these sorts of things. So the people, were, people rose up against the king and rebelled against him. This is how they gained the ascendancy over the earthly kingdoms. We read of King Henry, in, this is in the life and times of Hildebrand. Then in the penitent's garb of wool and barefoot, the king appeared before the walls of the fortress. He had laid aside every mark of royalty and fasting. He awaited the pleasure of the Pope for three days. The severity of the penance was enhanced by the coldness of the season. The king waited in the courtyard amid snow and ice. Even in the presence of Gregory, there were loud murmurs against his pride and inhumanity. So see how, how they got the kings to grovel to them. Just a bunch of priests with a whole lot of philosophy. The proud pontiff also claimed the power to depose emperors, Gregory, elated with his triumph, boasted that it was his duty to pull down the pride of kings. So we can see the rationalism, how they gain control over whole kingdoms. And it is rationalism that underpins the whole papal hierarchy. Once you sweep away the rationalism, the whole thing falls in a heap. So the greatest, therefore, the greatest fear of the, the papal hierarchy of these spiritual lords is fundamentalism. And what do I mean by fundamentalism? A system of beliefs based on the interpretation of every word in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, as literal truth. When you understand the Bible to be literally true, then you don't need someone to interpret it for you. You don't need someone to tell you that, the, that when it says Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, He's not really the only begotten Son of God like the, like the Catholic Church teaches you or that... When it says Jesus was born like us, and they tell you that he wasn't like us. You, don't, you, you, you take it literally and you believe it. And your eyes are now turned from them to, to, to the Bible, to God, to God's word. And you're no longer under their control. This is why they hate fundamentalists so much. Notice this. This is from the Vatican's official website. Beware of the fundamentalist groups. Everyone has his own. In Argentina, too, there is a little fundamentalist corner, and let us try with fraternity to go forward. Fundamentalism is a scourge, and all religions have some kind of fundamentalist cousin there, which forms a group. So, and what do you do with a scourge? You eradicate it. They really hate fundamentalism. It is not the COVID that is destroying humanity. It is the anti-Trinitarian tendency that has infected the family, country, and the world. It's even more dangerous than COVID, according to Cardinal Bow. To be an anti-Trinitarian, you have to be a fundamentalist. You have to literally believe John 3.16 and other texts. On such fundamentalist was Martin Luther. Now, Martin Luther, back in 1517, nailed his 95 theses to the door at Wittenberg there. And all they were were biblical objections to the doctrine of indulgences. He argued that the forgiveness was from the grace of God, not from paying money to the Pope. And he had, had 95 passages with scriptural evidence for his for his doctrine now he, he wasn't intending to 
to start a, a, re a revolution. That wasn't his intention. He just wanted to. Sh he's, this is what I believe, and this is you, what you what you're teaching is wrong. And that had a domino effect, and obviously, and he found out so many other things that were wrong about the Catholic Church, and that's what started the Reformation. But the the reason that got it going was just a literal understanding of Scripture that he had found a love for. And the result was that people's eyes turned from off from the the hierarchy to to the Bible to you know the truth. He would the, the Catholic Church kept the Bible from people, but people like Martin Luther were were giving the Bible. He actually had one translated into the vulgar German tongue, tongue and and had it distributed. So the power the hierarchy had over the minds evaporated in just a few short, short years, and the dominion that Rome had held for so many ages collapsed almost overnight. And the Protestant lands begin to see the illegitimacy of the papal dominion over them. This is where I'm leading into the, the point about the authorities of this world. Let's have a look at the Protestant perspective of the papal supremacy during the Dark Ages. And later we're going to have a look at what the Catholics thought of it, how the Catholics viewed the, the supremacy that the Pope held during the Dark Ages. This is from William Tyndale's book, The Obedience of a Christian Man. I ordered this book. It's really nice. I really like it. Written in 1528, the authorities in England banned the book, but they were being smuggled in by a friend of his who worked in the import trade. So what did he think of the hierarchy during the Dark Ages? What good conscience can there be among our spirituality, the church hierarchy, to gather so great treasure together and with hypocrisy of their false learning to rob almost every man of house and lands? So it was their false learning that took the money out of the country. I pass over with silence how they teach princes in every land to lay new exactions and tyranny on their subjects. So he realized that the problem, the tyranny was, was coming largely from Rome. They have robbed all realms, not of God's word only, but of all the wealth and prosperity and have driven peace out of all lands and withdrawn themselves from all obedience to princes and have separated themselves from the laymen, counting them viler than dogs, and have set up that great idol, the whore of Babylon, Antichrist of Rome, who they call Pope. I really like the um, straightforward way he writes. But notice that they have withdrawn themselves from obedience of all princes. They thought they were above the earthly powers. We can see he saw that papal supremacy over the princes of this world as illegitimate. Protestants place the legitimate sovereign power in the kings of the world, not the Pope. And that's what gave rise to this idea that is known as the divine right of kings. I'm going to read from a Catholic source now. He's going to define divine right of kings. Notice the slant he has on it, but I think most of what he says is actually quite accurate. This is from a, a book called The Political Philosophy of St. Robert Bellarmine by a Catholic scholar called John Clement Ragga. I'm going to be quoting from this quite a bit. The religious revolt against Rome, he's talking about the Reformation, in the first half of the 16th century gave new impetus to the rapid expansion of this absolutist tendency. Royal power must be exalted as against that of the Pope, was the cry of the divine right theorists. Luther based royal authority upon divine right with practically no reservation. Calvin judged that the people are unfit to govern themselves. I actually agree with him. Bluntly, remarks that after the Reformation, the Lutheran theologians began to proclaim the sayings of Paul. The powers that be are ordained of God as a Christian dogma. Well, that's what the Bible says. And to declare those in authority the anointed representatives of God. Okay, I don't know if Luther was calling those in authority the representatives of God, um, the anointed representatives of God. I think that's, that's, um, not, really a, that's not really a way I would describe it. But it's. But while I believe there's merit in this argument of the divine right of kings for what, I'm, what we're going to get into, the Protestants did take it too far. We read about King Henry VIII. The supreme head of the Church of England was a title created in 1531 for King Henry VIII when he first began to separate the Church of England from the authority of the Holy See. King Henry asserted himself as like the Pope in the English Church. This is obviously... This is obviously wrong. You know. um, some people argue that William Tyndale's book, Obedience of a Christian Man, supported this idea. I, I didn't find that in there. I haven't read it all yet, but I haven't found that in there, and I, I don't believe it. But um, I think it sounds like it's sort of a slanderous thing from the Jesuits to me. 
let's examine Tyndale's book to see the way he perceived the, the king's role in secular affairs and spiritual affairs. Let the kings take their duty of their subjects and that, that it is necessary to the defense of the realm. Let them rule their realms themselves, meaning without the Pope, with the help of laymen that are sage, wise, learned, and expert. Christ says that his kingdom is not of this world. He's separating the king's work from the work of the church. To preach God's word is too much for half a man, and to minister temporal kingdom is too much for half a man also. Either one requireth an whole man. One therefore cannot well do both. So you can see it's sort of a fledgling conception of separation of church and state, that the kings were to rule secular affairs, not, not be part of the church. Let's read another passage from this book. He really doesn't muck around when he speaks. God hath made the king in every realm judge over all, and over him there is no judge. It means that no one can condemn the king. He that judgeth the king judgeth God, and he that layeth hands on the king layeth hand on God, and he that resisteth the king resisteth God and damneth God's law and ordinance. Now that's a pretty strong way to put it, isn't it? If the subjects sin, they must be brought to the king's judgment. If the king sin, he must be reserved unto the judgment, wrath, and vengeance of God. And as it is to resist the king, so is it to resist his officer, which is set or sent to execute the king's commandment. Now, it may sound archaic and old-fashioned in our age of libertarianism and cultural refinement. It may rub us the wrong way, but is this, is this what, how, what the Bible teaches? I remember the reformers came to their conclusions because of a fundamentalist understanding of the Bible. And you can also notice that they were saying these things because they didn't want the Pope to get involved in the, in the affairs of their government because they knew that when he was, that, that God's people were persecuted. He didn't see if the, king sin, if the king sinned, according to Rome, he was subject to the vengeance wrath of, of the papacy and the people. Because the, the papacy would, would put the people under interdict and then the people, people would rebel against the king. And, and that would bring the king again, you know, he would, he would have no, no ability to govern. And that would, until he consented to Rome's um, terms, and that, that would therefore put him under the papacy. So he's saying this because, you know, to, in defense of, of the country against the papacy. Uh, this is what First Peter says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. The king as supreme. The king is, as far as secular terms go, the king is supreme. That's what Peter's saying here. You know, you can't read this any other way. Or unto governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, or for the praise of them that do well. For so it is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, not using your liberty as a cloak for maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So we're to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Not because we necessarily agree with the ordinances of man are saying. So long as they don't violate our conscience, we, we can submit ourselves to those things. Obviously, you know, when something, com when something comes to in conflict with your conscience... You have to obey God rather than men. But um, the Bible says here to, to submit to every ordinance of man. This is how they came up with this, these, these things they were saying. And we've read Romans 13. Powers of be are ordained of God. It's from these texts that Tyndale built this understanding. Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. According to this principle, there is no... The people have no right to challenge the authority of the appointed rulers because they are, they are ordained of God, as, as Romans 13 says. But, and they are, they are as, as Tyndale said, I believe, you know, God, God deals with them, not the people. The papacy, on the other hand, was overstepping the mark of this definition we see. They had um, terrorized well-doers rather than evildoers. They had they'd overstepped the mark. Anyway, and this is the way the Protestants saw it. Okay, so now let's have a look at a, a Catholic perspective of the papal supremacy during the, the Dark Ages. Totally opposite. It's interesting. This is from a first one I'm going to read is from a man called Lord Acton. 
He's a sort of a, a Catholic historian. It's quite, it's quite uh, interesting, actually. The Aryan tribes that persisted in their heresy were extirpated, totally destroyed. So obviously, that's talking about in 538, final destruction of the Aryan tribes. Then followed the ages which are not unjustly called the Dark Ages, in which there were laid the foundation of all the happiness that has since been enjoyed and of all the greatness that has ever been achieved by men. The good seed from which new Christian civilization sprang was striking root in the ground. Catholicism appeared as the religion of the masses. In those times of simple faith, there was no opportunity to call forth an Augustine or an Athanasius. It was not an age of conspicuous saints, but sanctity was at no time so general. The holy men of the first century shine with an intense brilliancy from the midst of the surrounding corruption. The history of the Middle Ages is the history of the gradual emancipation of man from every species of servitude. In proportion as the influence of the Catholic religion became more penetrating and more universal, the church could never abandon the principle of liberty by which she conquered pagan Rome. So I suppose he sees the Inquisition as an instrument of emancipation and liberty. You can see the, the total opposite opinion that Catholics have of the, of the Dark Ages, that it was an age of liberty and holiness. You know. You know, inspiration tells us the, the noontide of the papacy was the world's moral midnight. So according to the Catholics, these, these Catholic historians, what was the safeguard of the liberty and happiness of those ages of simple faith and sanctity? So-called sanctity. Let's ask John Clement Rager. During the Middle Ages, the freely recognized power and supreme position of the Pope proved to be a great check on, upon autocratic rulers. So it was the Pope's mild rule, according to them, that kept these despots in check. At the close of the 16th century, the power of the papacy, of the nobility and of the people was so weakened that the supporters of royal autocracy, encouraged by the religious defection from Rome, now ventured more boldly to put their theory into practice. Parliaments were dissolved. The tradition and constitutional limitation and the representative government was abandoned. The religious and civil rights and liberties of the people were disregarded. So according to these people, they had, they had all these constitutional and representative governments during the Dark Ages. The democracy of the Middle Ages was to be relegated to the past. Against this autocracy of kings and the abuse of political power, the Catholic Church raised her voice in no uncertain tone and emphatically reasserted both her religious independence and the rights of the people. So if democracy did exist in the Dark Ages, it was more of a farce than it is today. Notice the Catholic perspective from their opinion, the king's rule having supreme authority over the realm was an abuse. And they, they desired to return to the democracy of the Dark Ages. And how and through who did they raise her voice? The term we're going to use for this theology, this, this ideology is Bellarminian liberation theology. This is how they raised her voice against the autocratic rulership of the defectors from Rome, the Protestants, and their divine right of kings. So who was Cardinal Bellarmine? Robert Bellarmine was an Italian Jesuit and a cardinal of the Catholic Church. He was canonized a saint in 1930 and named Doctor of the Church, one of only 36. He was one of the most important figures in the Counter-Reformation. Okay, in 1930, he was canonized a saint. That was one year after the deadly wound was healed. It was all of his, all of his ideology was now so well ingrained that they could, they could raise him up on a pedestal. If you remember the, the Galileo affair, Cardinal Bellarmine was the adjudicator in the Galileo affair. He's the one that supposed that they would have you believe condemned Galileo for heresy when he actually didn't. The Galileo affair was just a publicity stunt to bring the Jesuit heliocentric doctrine back into the limelight because it wasn't really getting off the ground for him. So he was a very important man, this Cardinal Bellarmine. He was the, the main man in the Galileo affair. In, even the, the Jesuit guy Cosmoyano likens to the JFK assassination and the conspiracy theory. You can see who is he's adjudicating the dispute between Galileo and his opponents. Before we talk about this political ideology that he was using, employing to attack the, the, the idea that kings had the, had the right to rule over their realms, let's just have a look at the way that the Protestants re was rea were reacting to his writings. This is from that book again. The renowned Theodore Beza, he's a th Protestant theologian, expressed the opinion of those opposed to him. This book has ruined us, talking about Bellarmine's book. Queen Elizabeth directed that lectures be delivered against Cardinal Bellarmine in Cambridge, but instead of refuting Bellarmine, 
These lectures made him more widely known and believed. The professor, Justice Calvin, who studied Bellamine to refute him, was converted to Catholicism. What a disaster. In 1600, David Paris, professor at Heidelberg, opened the College anti bellaminaeum They opened a college to, to combat his writings, to train conversationalists to cope with the writings of Bellamine. Cardinal Dietrichson of Olmutz explained 20 editions in 30 years. Every word Bellamine is read, every word is received and believed as that of an oracle. There were no important Protestant theologians of the 17th century who did not attack Bellamine's writings. So this man, he was really wreaking havoc on Protestantism with what he was saying. It was having an effect, especially among the leadership. Now, I know, I know the Protestant leadership wasn't, you know, wholly right. They certainly were wrong on a lot of things. The fact that he was attacking them, you know, it says a lot. Man, what, what was his theology? What was it? Here's an example of it. Political power resides immediately in the whole multitude as an organic unit. The divine law has not given this power to any particular man. Therefore, it has given it to the multitude. Now, notice this in contrast to what Tyndale was saying. God hath made the king in every realm judge over all, and over him there is no judge. But he's saying political power rests, political power rests in the multitude. So you all have sovereign power, right? not the king. I just want to show the contrast here. Continues, there being no positive law to this effect, there is no reason why among equals one should have the greater right to rule than another. We're talking about political power here. I'm not talking about power of conscience or power of will. Our will is, is obviously, you know, we have a, a will of our own. It's not to be governed to by any man. Political power, the Bible says in, in Romans 13, let every soul to the high authorities be subject, for there is no authority except from God, and the authority existings are appointed by God. According to the Bible, the political power does not rest in the, in the multitude, it rests in the appointed authorities. So, the way that Cardinal Bellarmine and, and these, um, these Jesuits were say, they're saying, yes, the power comes from God, but it the power goes immediately to the people, and the people they give it to the ruler. So really, and so really, the power belongs to the people. Now, remember with the the rationalism we we're talking about, it always had a had an appeal to the carnal nature. It had an appeal to our desire, you know, for self exaltation. And this is really the appeal of this teaching. Now, it now if this if this was all all he was saying, it's really not it's not that. Um, uh, bad, but it's the conclusions they draw from these things. I'm going to get into. Sorry, it's been a bit technical, but I just feel it's important to show these things. Another thing he says: the idea that of sovereignty as directly committed by God to the people. This is from John Rag of not Cardinal Bellamine, by the way. The idea of sovereignty as directly committed by God to the people and then conferred upon some or some few of for their common will was indicated even by Aristotle. It was outlined more def definitely by St. Thomas Aquinas and more d fully developed and freely taught in the Dominican and Jesuit schools from the middle of the 16th century. So according to this Catholic historian, that the people are sovereign is an idea that was that comes from the Catholic Church. It comes from the Catholic Church. Now remember the timing of the, of the inception of these of this, um, this ideas and what they were being brought out for. The Protestant countries we saw William Tyndale was advocating that the king was 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 the ruler of the realm, not the popes. That his he was to be obeyed. He was um, he he had divine authority. But this this teaching is saying no. The people have divine authority. The king the king can be you know the king's just as equal as you. You don't you don't have to obey the king. That's the that's where this this was leading. This this is where the Jesuits were leading people with this teaching. Notice Cardinal Bellamine says this, Unjust laws are, properly speaking, no laws. A bad law is not a valid law, says Bellamine. Good laws are not a curtailment of liberty. Now, is it true that good laws are not a curtailment of liberty? Yeah, it is. It's true. It's true. A good law is not a curtailment of liberty. A bad law is a curtailment of liberty. You know, we're seeing a lot of that these days, aren't we? We're not allowed to, not allowed to go out without a face mask. We're, we're not allowed to travel five kilometers from our home in some places and all these different things. They're, these are curtailments of liberty. They're not good laws. When laws do not protect men's rights but infringe upon them, when laws are an impediment to the community's development and welfare, they are not good laws. That's true. And they are therefore not valid laws. 
So if the law's not valid, you don't have to obey it. The Bible says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now, I'm not saying we have to obey things that are a violation of our conscience. That's obviously not true. Peter, when he was confronted by the Ananias and the high priest, he said we ought to obey God rather than men. But what are, the, are these Jesuits and Catholic divines doing promoting liberty? Why are they the champions of liberty? Listen to Thomas Aquinas. If any society of people have the right of choosing a king for itself, which is this idea of sovereignty conferred on the people, it is not unjust if he be deposed by the same, if, or if his power be curbed, when by a royal tyranny he abuses his power. The reason they were, they were talking about this sovereignty of the people was because the people now have the right to, to you know, depose him. That's, why, that's what this was all about. That's why they were, that's why they were you know, um, saying all these libertarian things that have a real appeal with people. You know? Because when you're being oppressed by a tyrannical king, this is what you want to hear. You know, you're the sovereign. The king doesn't have a right over you. This was, this was in the you know, 13th century. Thomas Aquinas was saying that. This was a long time ago during the, the depth of the Dark Ages. But remember, they were, they were saying these things because, because they're the ones that put the kingdoms under interdict. They're the ones that said, your king's a tyrant, he's not doing this, and look, he's telling your liberty, you're not allowed to go to mass now, you know, you're all going to hell, you better depose him. See, it's a, it's a weaponized um, ideology. It's... And the main, the main problem with it, it's just to direct, directly against what the Bible says. The Bible says to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. The Bible says that, that, the, king, that, that the authorities are appointed by God. It doesn't say that, that you, are, you are, you know, as far as secular power goes, we don't have secular power. That is, that is something that is appointed by God. I don't, I don't believe that. Our king, the kingdom, Christ's kingdom is not of this world. Christ said, oh, my kingdom is not of this world. This then would my servants fight. This is just rationalization to bring into accord with reason or cause something to seem reasonable. It seems very reasonable what they're saying. It does. It really does seem reasonable. But it's not biblical. It's not in harmony with the principles of God's uh, administration. And as we can see, we, we, just, we know their reason for it. It's to weaponize, a weaponized ideology. Brings me back to this verse again. Liberty to them promising themselves being the servants of the corruption. The Vatican, the Jesuits are the servants of the of corruption. For by whom any one hath been overcome, to this one also he hath been brought into servitude. Remembering he was a Jesuit, one of the most important figures in the Counter-Reformation. Why, why would he be touting liberty so much? The, the Jesuit oath says, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity arises, presents make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am ordered to do by the Pope. Their goal is the destruction of Protestants and liberals and freedom. They don't believe in liberty. They just tell you they do and then, and then deceive you and bring you into servitude. I'm not advocating that any, any f distinct form of government or any... any um, you know, changing changes to be made. Obviously, I'm just, I just want to show the deception of this kind of ideology, because it's useful for us to know. Because it's gonna, it's gonna become, it's gonna become pretty heated in this world very soon. Now, this principle that we've spoken about, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. We've spoken that if people rebel against the authorities that God has ordained, that vengeance is taken on them sevenfold. God allows vengeance to be taken upon them sevenfold because they have sinned against his, his um, ordinance. Cain has the, has the um, he's allowed to, to, to exercise that, that he's been given that, and Cain is represented by the, the worst, uh, worldly, worldly powers. Now, do you, do you think that the Jesuits understand this principle? Absolutely, they do. Absolutely. I actually believe in the highest sense, the, the Catholic Church is Cain's the Senate, and they even admit it. Listen, listen to this. The mark of Cain is stamped upon our foreheads. Across the centuries, our brother Abel was lain in blood, which we drew, and shed tears we caused by forgetting thy love. Now, this is just a frank admission. 
They don't say things because they, they repent. They're just admitting the truth. They don't change. They admit that. So they understand this principle. So with all this ideology, they are provoking men to rebel against the powers that be, which is rebellion against God. And when people rebel against God, that gives more power to them. Seven times shall vengeance be taken if anyone slayeth, killeth Cain. So it's in their interest to provoke rebellion against the powers that be. It's in, it's in the Catholic Church's the interest to provoke them to rebellion. Now, the, the French Revolution was a perfect illustration of this. It was an exercise in Bellarmenian liberation theology also. L listen to even the words, liberty, quality, fraternity. Well, we all equal sovereigns, liberty. You know. Now, Voltaire was the strongest influence, the, f the strongest literary influence in that revolution. Voltaire said a lot of true things. He decried the vices of, of the clergy and the king. The King Louis XVI was a bad king and his father, were, they were both terrible. But his writings inspired the people to rebel against the king. As we read here, listen to what he said. So long as the people do not care to exercise their freedom, those who wish to tyrannize will do so. If men are born free, just like Cardinal Bellarmine actually is the one that came up with that, born free, they will govern themselves. If men have tyrants, they must remove them. The people rebelled against the king. And that began the reign of terror. They killed, the, they killed King Louis the Sixteenth, and and then the reign of terror. They they removed one tyrant, and a dozen more wicked than him popped up after him. You can see this this principle being played out there. And that we're told that that will be repeated on a world scale. Now the reason that the French Revolution happened was that the the French people rejected the Reformation. They rejected the God's voice coming through the Reformation. And um, finally, they reaped what they sowed. They they got a wicked king because they had because they were they were corrupt. They weren't they didn't accept God's truth. So when you don't accept God's truth, doesn't God doesn't give you a good king? And they got a bad king, and then they were unhappy with him. They killed him, and then they and they all got killed in Paris anyway. It brought only misery to them. And as great controversy says, to throw off the restraint which God has imposed is to accept the rule of the cruelest of tyrants. You know, they threw off the law of God. They made a law that there was no God. And listen to what William Tyndale says. The French people could have learned from this. It is better to suffer one tyrant than many, and to suffer wrong of one than of every man. See, he understands that God has appointed a tyrant. Sometimes a tyrant is needed. Yea, and it is better to have a tyrant unto thy king than a shadow, a passive king that doth naught for himself, but suffereth others to do with him what they will, and to lead him wherever they desire. That's exactly what happened with King Louis XVI. He wouldn't deal with problems in his kingdom. So a, a, a strong, a, a tyrannical king is actually beneficial. For a tyrant, though he do wrong unto the good, yet he punisheth the evil and maketh all men obey, neither suffereth any man to poll but himself only. A king that is soft as silk and effeminate, that is to say, turned to the nature of a woman, shall be much more grievous unto the realm than a right tyrant. That's true. Sometimes a tyrant is, is needed. The tyrant is, is of God's appointment in the sense that he punishes evil because that's what needs to be done. Let's read in some more from William Tyndale here. Heads and governors are ordained of God and are even the gift of God, whether they be good or bad. And whatsoever is done to us by them, that doth God, and be it good or bad. If they be evil, why are they evil? Verily for our wickedness sake are they evil. Because that when they were good, we would not receive that goodness of the hand of God and be thankful, submitting ourselves unto his laws and his ordinances, but abuse the goodness of God unto our sensual and beastly lusts. I really believe this. People get wicked rulers because they are wicked people. That's, that's just that's how it works. The more, the more corrupt a society is, the more corrupt their leaders. That's just, it's obvious. Just look around, look, you know, that's what you see. The world is... The world is degenerating rapidly now because people are degenerating morally. Look at the way all these laws about um, homosexuals that have been passed lately and, um, as, and the, the, just the general immorality in society and we're getting tyranny. It's just a result of the corruption of the people. Therefore doth God make his scourge of them and turn them to wild beasts contrary to the nature of their names and offices. 
even unto lions, bears, foxes, and unclean swine, to avenge himself on our unnatural and blind unkindness and of our rebellious disobedience. So tyrants are the rod of correction from God. They're ordained of God, but that doesn't mean that God is the author of all of their actions. The quintessential tyrant, you know, Hitler, right? God was not the author of all his, of his actions. But notice reason from cause to effect. Germany and Europe were, had great life from the Reformation. The Protestant Germany was the, was the beginning of the Reformation, the pro, strong Protestant, Protestant stronghold. But obviously there's, there was a decline. And um, that decline led to them accepting a wicked person in the, in the, in the ruler of, of Hitler. You can't, they, they got a, a, a corrupt leader, you know, because of backsliding, like we're getting, we're getting today. And he wasted Germany and all the rest of Europe. Well, when these things happen, they make you stop and think, you know, why, why did this happen? You know, they, they can make people turn to God. You know, that doesn't mean when, when you have a wicked king to obey the king in every audience doesn't mean you have to fight in his wars or man the gas chambers. You know, many refused to do that during during the war in war in World War Two. Notice here in Second Thessalonians, talking about the wicked and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God is not the author of lies. The father of lies is the devil. He's the one that sends the, sends, he's the, one that sends the lies out. But God is, God is permitting it to happen. God is giving up on you. He's giving you what you wanted. You wanted lies? Okay, he's giving it to you. He's sending you a strong delusion. He's giving you up. He's giving you back corrupt leaders to, to, to tyrannize you because that's what you deserve. You know, that's, it's just a reason from cause to effect. Notice another verse, Psalm 107. He turneth rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground. So the, the springs dry up. You get drought, you get famine. A fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. God changes the, the landscape to punish people for their wickedness. That's what happened in, in Israel. And then again, he turneth the wilderness into standing water and dry ground into water springs. So he can reverse it as well. God blesses you. You read Deuteronomy. God blesses you for, for well-doing. He curses you for, for evil doing. And, and, and he gives good kings. He gives bad kings. That's how it works. And that's why Tyndale came to this conclusion. If we resist evil rulers seeking to set ourselves at liberty, we shall no doubt bring ourselves into more evil bondage, just like what happened in the French Revolution, and wrap ourselves in much more misery and wretchedness. A Christian man in respect of God is but a passive thing, a thing that suffereth only and doth not. That's not because he's a coward or because he doesn't care. That's because a Christian man understands that Christ's kingdom is not of this world. He understands that, that God, God is the ultimate ruler, that that sets up kings and puts down kings. He doesn't have to fight for his rights. All he has to do is fight for the truth, and keep his conscience clean, and leave the consequences with God. We read in Desire of Ages, the government unto which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. He who was our example kept aloof from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. See, this is, the, this is our fight. Not, we should be aloof from earthly powers. When you understand this principle, it doesn't you don't feel it's actually a great burden lifts from you you know you don't feel the need to interfere or you know the, you know that this world it's 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 well this world can't be saved this world can't be fixed all the things that are happening in the world are happening under god's eye he know he's he's got it all under control and people are reaping what they sowed and you, we shouldn't get in the way of that and if we're part of that we're actually we're actually become um, guilty as as romans 13 says he that resists shall receive damnation but what about righteous people? We, we see how we see how, you know, the wicked can be taught a lesson by tyrannical rulers. But what about people or righteous people? What about what about people that that know God that in profession anyway, 
What about us that are trying to serve God? Tyndale writes about that. They would say, what good doth such persecution and tyranny unto the righteous? It's a question that you might ask. When all is at peace and man, no man troubleth us, we think that we are patient and love our neighbours as ourselves. But let our neighbour hurt us in word or deed, and then find we it otherwise. Then fume we and rage and set up the bristles and bend ourselves to take vengeance. If we loved with godly love for Christ's kindness sake, we should desire no vengeance, but pity him and desire God to forgive and amend him. So when something happens to you, you see a different side of yourself. And put this in the perspective of, of tyrannical rulers. You know, what, what about when our, our liberties our liberties curbed or our, you know, we're restricted from doing things? When Jesus was being nailed to a cross, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. I know I certainly haven't reached that level of brotherly kindness. So persecution and, and tyranny can, can be good for even God's people. He continues, adversity also I received of the hand of God as a wholesome medicine, though it be somewhat bitter. Temptation and adversity doth both kill sin and also utter it. For th though a Christian man knoweth everything how to live, yet is the flesh so weak that he can never take upon up his cross himself and kill and mortify the flesh. He must have another laid on his back. If it was up to us and things just kept going as they are and with relative ease, would the work ever get done? No, no, we're not, that's why it means that he must have another laid on his back. You must have, you must have, a, have oppression, persecution, tyranny in order for, you know, for us to move forward. You know, we're not going to do it if God doesn't push us forward. You know, it's just a sad reality. I, I know that. In many also sin lieth hid within and festereth and rotteth inward and is not seen so that they think how good and perfect and keep the law. When st things start to happen, then we're going to know ourselves. So this, this, all these things that are happening are also for, for the good of God's people to, to help us to sharpen us, you know, to get us ready, to, to push us forward to do the work. Just to, to wrap it up now, I want to, I want to reiterate the, this ingenious sophistry that Rome has invented um, to, to get men to fulfill what she wants what she wants to bring about she wants rome is behind all of this this fake pandemic and um, lockdowns and all this stuff they're 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 pushing the population and it's they're going to push them to rebellion i, I want to talk about that next time that's the point and rem remember when the people rebel vengeance is taken sevenfold on them and that's what's going to ultimately bring the world back into the bondage of the dark ages and it's going to happen for a little bit revelation 17 says it for one hour, whatever that hour of time that is. So these this ideology promises us liberty, but brings 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 you into the bondage to the servants of corruption. That dominion that Rome lost after the Reformation, when when um, the sovereign rulers began to assert their authority over their realms, has is 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 slowly being regained to them through this ideology, this rebellion that's that's been incited among the countries. Um, the winner of all these rebellions is the papacy. You know, it's it's not it's not the people. They're the losers. They're the ones that get brought into bondage by it. Because rebelling against the authorities is rebelling against God. That's what it is. This is Lord Acton. Freedom will most will be most complete where there is no actual diversity to be resisted and no theoretical unity to be maintained, but where unity exists as the triumph of truth not of force, through the victory of the church, not through the enactment of the state. We know it's not going to be like that. It's not going to be through force and the enactment of the state. But, but you can see they call it freedom. When the, when, the, when the Catholic Church is back in supreme control, that's freedom, that's freedom in their opinion. This guy lived 100 years ago. You've probably heard this quote, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's a very common quote. Now, there's, you know, there's truth in that. But just notice the, the, the libertarian concept being used to, to bring back the world into, under the control of the papacy. It's just all these libertarians are, are backed by the Pope. Voltaire. The interest of the human race requires a check to restrain sovereigns and to protect the lives of the people. This check of religion 
might in a general convention be placed in the hands of the popes. The fear of papal excommunication undoubtedly tended to confine aggression within limits and to make rulers temper expediency with right reason. Even this deist admits that, that the pope should be in control. He can control the kings. So, so, and that's what the final, the final giant uh, revolt that's going to happen in the world is going to do. It's going to bring the world back under the, under the control of Rome. They're going to bring order out of the chaos. And I hope to maybe talk about that again another time. But as Christians, as fundamentalist Christians, which means you literally interpret the Bible, I, I agree with what the Protestants wrote, with what Tindal wrote, that you know, we are to, to respect the king and all of the ordinances of men, to, um, you know, to not revolt against them. You know, that actually is a rebellion against God. So, you know, because he, God's kingdom is not of this world. We don't need to worry about fighting for these things and, and our rights and all these sorts of things. It's, it's, it's a fight that, that God, God is, vengeance is God. So I invite you to kneel with me as we close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath again. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you've had so many faithful servants throughout the ages that have fought uh, bravely in the battles that, that um, you've commanded us to fight. And we, we know there's a battle coming that, that uh, we are, um, according to your will, we will be fighting in. We just pray that you'll help us to um, be obedient to every word that comes out of your mouth, to understand um, the nature of, of this world, the administration you've given. Please uh, give us all eyesight to understand uh, the right interpretation of Scripture and that we might not be misled by sophistry and all these sorts of um, things that we see in the world. And we just uh, pray that you'll continue to help us study and, and learn together. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.